Okay, welcome to Call to Your Creative. I'm your host, Luke Gledhill. Essentially, this is a platform that ha is a conversation with incredible people that do amazing things. And I also run a brand development agency called Just Up The Road that helps brands, people, and companies really portray their brand message, their narrative to the end customer or the end citizen. And I also host the 21st Club Think Tank that brings together people that do good and give back through social, spiritual and environmental initiatives. So by very luck chance, um, I was uh, able to meet Charlie here at the weekend just gone. I had an incredible conversation with him and um, we're going to get into it more deeper now so that everybody can hear Charlie's story. So Charlie, welcome. Thanks, <clears throat> Please give us your full name and, and very briefly what you currently do right now. Uh, my name is Charlie Stewart Gay. I'm um, president of Sonara Hotels, which is a hotel group that started on the beach of Tulum, Mexico. Uh, I'm also a co-founder of The Real Coconut, which is a consumer packaged goods company. Now in about six or 7,000 stores. Wow. in the US and Canada. And then we've launched a virtual kitchen, conscious kitchen model in Malibu with uh, opportunity to go into other cities around the world. Uh, then we have a family wealth uh, foundation called Influence Foundation. And we have a clean agriculture fund that I'm very involved with that I uh, visioned um, for the planet to do with clean agriculture. Yeah. And there are a few other things. And then I'm a dad to Daniela and I, my wife, Daniela Hunter and I have five kids between 19 and 11. Wow. So it's all going on. <clears throat> Just having a family that size seems busy enough, for, let alone all of the businesses you founded and run and the foundation and all of the other humanitarian work yeah. you do and everything. I mean, we spoke on Saturday uh, when we visited the Real Coconut Kitchen in Malibu, and it was incredibly impressive to see the array of offer on menu with a very much clean diet kind of guys with very much, there was a lot of vegan options, but there was very clean offer on meat. And, and you and I instantly started talking about agriculture and about how food is, is brought in or grown and, and everything like that. Do you want to talk a little bit about, before we go back further into your history, but could you talk a bit about how, really how important food and agriculture is right now with, with regards to what you do at the Real Coconut Kitchen? Yeah, no, I'd love to talk about that. <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's, to put it in context, over the last 2,000 years, we've all thought things are important to do with black and white, men and women, religion, geography, our country as opposed to someone else's country. And we're at a point now where chaos is bringing forward certain truths around all these former judgments of the last 2,000 years. But what is inevitable is that we'll have 10 to 11 billion people on the planet by 2050. And even now, there's an inevitability around agriculture because of the pressure of climate. And so for us, when I say us, my wife and I and the collective teams that are around us, we put everything into context around food production and water rights, water rights. Not the making of water, but the control of water that's beginning to make water blue gold. So, sorry to stop you, Charlie, but water rights, like that, for somebody that might not know, yeah. it, it, is it mythical, right? That doesn't make any sense. Just explain about what you mean with water rights. You mean who controls the rights of water? Yeah. So throughout time, you know, gold was created from metals. Romans paid their soldiers in gold rather than grain. By Nero, you know, money's energy was probably fear, guilt, greed, shame, hoarding, and lack. And we all buy into it. We all do. And then we're, the economy is stimulated 
by companies with multiple earnings and things like that. And they make products. But water is beginning to become a fundamental scarcity and at the same time a fundamental need for the pressing movement of food production. It wasn't for a billion people during the Industrial Revolution, but now there's seven and a half or whatever, nearly eight billion people going to 11. So water has always had its, its um, people have fought wars over water forever. Even we're in California, and you look at the history of California between Northern Cal and Southern Cal, or even movies like Chinatown, which was made in 71, 72 with the young Jack Nicholson, that was based on water, funnily enough, wow. because most of the water in California is being sourced in Northern Cal. So that's, I mean, it's all about the control of water. And you can look at that in Africa. You can look at it in Asia. You can look at it in, throughout. And even what we're baited to believe around water and the cost of water, for instance, we all pay our water bills. And I bet there isn't anybody on this uh, broadcast that just looks at their water bill and says, what? Right. <laughs> Why should it be so expensive, right? Why should a bottle of water that you get from the gasoline station that happens to be in a plastic bottle be $2.70? And why would you buy it? Yeah, yeah. Because it's actually costing you more than the gasoline in the car. Those who control the idea around water, in that case, it's the control of the plastic and the making of the plastic and also the movement of the water to you to drink it. So that company that makes that water is actually in the oil business because yeah. it takes oil to make the plastic, oil, oil to move it to you, because oil is a pretty heavy product to distribute, and water is a difficult product to distribute around. Right. So we're baited to believe the cost of water. And um, there'd be many that have said that the future, and you're even starting to see movies, you know, Mad Max and all these type of movies, that project into the future water. It's not a, it's not a uncommon thought, but we we look at it in regards to food production. So let me ask you this then, because I've read and heard, uh, and I'm understanding a lot about regenerative agriculture and, and the way forward for food production. Right? Yeah. In the U.S. across the world. Yeah. In your opinion or your point of view, do you think then that water is the most important part versus actually the regenerative agri? I mean, I know regenerative agriculture draws down carbon from the atmosphere and and everything else, but do you do you believe that? And when we talk, when I what I ask you specifically mean is with regards to the food production, but what you're saying is it's the water rights that are going to be controlling the food production. Yes, to a degree. When you look at, so the I mean, the question is, um, is water the pivotal aspect of regenerative agriculture? The answer is it's part of it. It's not everything. Um, the love of power in agriculture would have made um, the income that you got from an acre, if you're a farmer in America, pretty minimal. Some people say as low as a dollar an acre. Wow. Because, and that wasn't based on the water. That was based on what was being put into the soil or, way, or, the, way, or the way that the soil was being tilled or farmed over the last 150 years. Um, so water wouldn't have caused that. Um, the idea of multi-cropping and the idea of moving away from corn, for instance, uh, which has obviously come under a majorly heavy wrap as far as its yields in like Iowa and places like that. The farmers rely on subsidies to be able to live. But no, it's 
practically they're no different to people living in slums in Nairobi. Wow. So, so let me ask you this then, Charlie, just so people can understand then. The, the cost per acre, and you mentioning that farmers in Iowa, wherever in middle America, are subsidized to grow corn, okay? Correct. So what, what the subsidies mean is that comes from the government Correct. to um, keep them growing that produce on their land. So actually, if they grew that without the subsidies, their land would almost be worthless. Correct. And so talk a bit more as to why that is stuck in a loop of being subsidized for a yield of crop that's going down every year for what they yield per acre because of what they're putting into the land, as in the chemicals they use to grow the crops. Well, we all, we, we all have habits. And if you're a farmer whose father was a farmer, whose father was a farmer, and you farmed a particular crop, that would be what happens. I mean, today in Belize, for instance, Belize is an interesting country like the United States. It's, it's uh, very close to the United States. It's only five hours wa water distance from Belize City to Houston. So it's like going from Los Angeles. It's much closer, actually, than Los Angeles to New York. But Belize was made to grow citrus because of concentrated orange and the demand of companies like Minute Maid, what have you. Citrus was never native to that country or to the rest of the Caribbean, but it grew there because they needed cheap labor and they needed proximity to the U.S. market. The last few years, because it's not native, believe the citrus had a blight in it. The small farmer couldn't afford, fortunately, pesticides and, and fertilizer and bad stuff, so he went and grew again, and he had another blight. So there we're working with the government, and we're directors of the Belize Sustainable Development Corporation, on figuring ways of multi-cropping crops that are irrevocable. So we, we imported crops to grow in certain places. Sometimes those crops weren't even native to that land. Right. That probably would tell me that it's not sustainable long term. Something would happen and that crop would wither and die. Right. In the, yeah. So what you're saying is for a couple of seasons, the crop has had an issue, hasn't been able to grow or yield what they need. And so now they're facing not knowing what to do on their land and they need to really be producing new crops or multi-crops on the land. Yeah, Belize is fortunate because it's, it is in a humid area so and it has ideal conditions. So Hershey, for instance, who everyone knows the name Hershey, chocolate, he had his chocolate in Cuba. And he put in trains, and he was pre-Castro. Hershey was doing a lot in Cuba. Castro comes along. Hershey, Hershey has to move his cacao very quickly. He moved it to Belize. The European Union moves $40 million worth of bananas because Britain has always had a great relationship because he, Belize used to be part of the Commonwealth. They moved their fish in four days. So... What I'm saying about Belize and every country is that there are crops that should grow native that are irrevocable and, are, and, and should be grown. And when they grow, and if they're given a value and a currency, which we're now seeing because of the things that our companies and other companies are doing around gluten and grain-free crops, those currencies then sustain the farmers in a far more viable beneficial way than you know some of these crops that we've been forced to grow wow wow that's crazy so charlie talk a bit more about what you just briefly mentioned then talk a bit more about what you you're doing with your companies and what other companies are doing with farmers and, and working with them together to help yeah well on the bigger picture it's pretty clear that if there's 10 or 11 billion people on the planet by 2050 and, and the climate meetings and the sustainability councils of the world would say there are four things we have to do. We have to reduce food waste. 
we have to move to a plant-focused diet, and I'll explain that a bit more. Uh, the third is we have to return the land to the ownership of the indigenous. Well, what I mean by that, and the fourth is we have to produce more tonnage per hectare. In countries like Africa, U.S. produces four to eight ton. Africa produces one ton per hectare. So if we move the needle on all four of those things, there is a chance that 10 or 11 billion people can be fed. Yeah. We're not, I want to say off the top, our, our, our CPG brand is labeled vegan and paleo. And, and we're in Costco and we're at Whole Foods and we're, chains are picking up our grain-free tortillas and grain-free chips. We pioneered using coconut flour. Coconut flour was a byproduct of coconut oil. And in Asia, there was so much oil being produced that there was this throwaway sediment from the pulp. Wow. And the pulp allowed us to produce an organic, certified organic, grain-free flour with suppliers in Sri Lanka and the Philippines, landed in our factories in California at probably two to three times less price than almond flour. Wow. And almonds goes back to that point which we were talking about before the, with water rights, because almonds were put into the Mid Valley of California. The biggest producer in the world of almonds is the Mid Valley of California. And almonds have become popular, almond milk, almond uh, recipes and foods. The one place that almonds should never have been put in the whole world was in the Mid Valley of California. Right. There's no freaking water. Right. So. And it takes 10, at, at the moment, still 10 gallons of water to make one nut. Wow. 10 gallons of water to make one nut. So it's a bit, it, and the more that grew, the more at the end of the day, people will end in tears because it's, it's not really sustainable. Mm. Fortunately, coco coconuts, once it hits the ground and the meat's matured, there's 30 products that can be made from it. Wow. So we champion these crops that don't require, they're called low impact crops, that don't require irrigated water. And they're coconut, plantain, which is currency to be made for the planet. Because we see all our breads, pancakes that you probably tasted, um, baking with plantain flour will be fantastic. Wow. There's still just a small supply coming out of Nigeria and Chile at the moment. So we're on a massive campaign with governments to move their farmers into multi cropping with plantain because they take nine months to grow. Right. Nine to 10 months with 20 seedlings. And coconut takes three to five years. Wow. And then uh, hemp, which has been on a lot of people's um, intent, uh, attention in the last period of a couple of years, as it should be, because hemp is a remarkable product. And it was kiboshed by in America by the DuPont families and the um, and the Hess families because right. originally the first Model T car Model T right. Ford right hemp no way Constitution of the United States of America all the draft papers hemp wow these two families love of power put a kibosh on it said hemp's a bit like drugs so we're not going to have right. it right? Right. right now we're touching hemp bricks. 100%. You know, every insulation in buildings should be hemp insulation instead of the crap that we put into yeah, the buildings. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and then uh, we also work with algae. And we have a greenhouse in Amsterdam with a great, great guy there. And Holland, of course, has grown flowers forever. So you can imagine that algae grows well and it's uh, water that's uh, fresh and and oceans is brackish water. And, and here's the point. Every breath that you and I have been taking during this interview, 50 to 80% of it, depending on the season, I don't know where we are now, but 50 to 80% of it comes from the algae. No way. Not from the trees. Trees are vital, got to keep them. But if we mess up the algae, so what, why isn't that talked more about? Because obviously right now there's a large focus on trees and forests 
being cut down around the world. Obviously, yeah. we see a lot and hear a lot about that. And and um, I won't go too deep into that. But why do you think? Why aren't people talking more about algae then? I think they will. I mean, you look at we've been putting it into drink products now for four or five years at, in Tulum. And we've now started launching it here in America in the countries, in the kitchens. Um, it has every nutrient known to man. It is absolutely the ideal product. And if you look at what we're eating on our plate of food at the moment, there's so little nutrient in the meal that we're eating that things like, really not things like, marine phytoplankton and algae will become a necessary or an added uh, supplement to the meal that we're having so that we can have the nutrients that our body craves. Um, why the conversation hasn't been had is strange. We're bringing it forward. I think plastic in the ocean became, and it should be, a huge concern. And algae was not really a necessarily a sexy thing that we could log on to. We could we could see a picture of a turtle with uh, six cans of beer, plastic things around their neck, you know, or all this all the plastic washing up on our beaches. So algae is just there. Yeah. But the reality is, the conversation will come forward over the next few years. Well, let me ask you this then, Charlie, because I'd love your opinion. Do you think that those conversations are suppressed in some way because mm. the bigger companies, the bigger conglomerates in the food space haven't quite figured out or realized how to monetize algae, whereas, you know, put sugar in food, processed food, and they can sell that all day long? I you know, as I said, I'm an activator rather than an activist, so I don't point fingers too much. And the CEO that we now have, uh, the Real Coconut uh, Products Company, we're just about to change the branding name because we're involved with so many of these other crops beyond just coconut. But our CEO came at us. She ran General Mills for 32 years. Wow. Well, she didn't run it for 32 years. She finished up running it. She ran Cheerios and Wheaties. She started with the Jolly Green Giant. And Camille came at us and said, what you're doing is amazing. Your fundamentals are amazing. So most of these companies have very heartfelt people. It's just a matter of two things. One, getting the economy right for a product. It's like people will say, how can you sell chips in a plastic bag? It's a really good statement. Yeah. And people are starting to put tax in France and England is trying to figure it out, you know, with their crisps and everything. But the distributors for food that you buy your food from in a supermarket require an eight month shelf life for manufacturing to, because they'll pick out the product, it will go to their, to their depots, it will then go to, the Sainsbury's or the whatever, or the wait waitresses or the or the uh, Safeways over here or Whole Foods, and then the window is only another two or three more months beyond that. So you've got to have a a a bag that lasts eight months. You can't have a bag that lasts six months if you're going to sell a product that's available for the masses. You could say you could sell me a compostable bag. For 40 cents an imprint. Right. The imprint cost has to be eight to 10 cents to create a bag that, say, to, you know, a single bag, single serve bag is $1.99 or less. Yeah. You know, three ounce is $2.99. Yeah. Well, five, our five ounce bag is $3.99 or $4.99. You know? So it's economics that actually holds this back. Right. Most people want to do, especially in, in natural foods and in food, they've got good hearts. You know, obviously there are there are companies out there, like I alluded to, with water and plastic bottles that maybe don't necessarily want to be out of the plastic business because that's actually the business they're in. Right. So, Charlie, I found this really intriguing 
I want to go back to what got you, what brought you to America. And then when you explain a bit about that, I can see you smiling. And then we'll, I'd like to go back into uh, the real coconut and then also your hotels in, in Tulum and everything. Yeah. So can you t- tell me about, let's go back, uh, younger Charlie in, in the UK. Talk to me a bit about that and then your journey from where you went from there to here. Well, younger Charlie, like a lot of young people in the late 70s, was sort of rattling around trying to figure out who he was. You know, um, and uh, I didn't really know who I was. So I was pretty messy and I was called a rebel. And News of the World used to write articles calling us upper class aristocratic gay crashing punks because <laughs> we were all on the King's Road, landed on the King's Road when when Sex Pistols came out. And I didn't know what to do. A lot of my peers were obviously going into the bank, banking or politicians, because I actually went to Eton. But I was so such a rebel that I didn't take a dollar from my dad because he wouldn't have given it to me, right. even though we had a most amazing relationship till he died when he was 93. And that shaped me because I wasn't reliant on things. And I was sleeping on the floors of my offices in the Haymarket. But my mom's family were all in horse racing. And so... And I could ride racehorses as a kid before I grew. And, and so I couldn't get a drink quick enough at a, a race meeting. And, uh, and so I set up tents, hospitality tents. And all my mates who didn't know how to work were selling hospitality over the phone right. to all the corporations. And all my girlfriends were hospitality girls. And, and we became very good, known for it. And then Thatcher was a client, the Conservative Party, uh, Major Ferguson, I was doing stuff with around polo and packaging the royal family. And then I met um, all the ticket touts because I needed the tickets for Wimbledon and places like that. And then I met the boys that were sort of redeveloping the Docklands. And then I was asked to be managing director of the London Arena wow. by Frank Warren, um, who's still alive, even though uh, he got shot you know, a long time ago, he survived. And, and so that made, made me a promoter. So, just, sorry, Charlie, just for everyone in the US, the London Arena, what's the equivalent in, in America? Well, at the time it was, uh, the equivalent in, in America would be any arena that uh, basketball's played in, right. or, or Staples Center would be good, because we, we set it up to have multiple uses. Right. So we had concerts, we had Hulk Hogan, we had tennis matches with McEnroe against Edberg. Um, we had events, and it, it, but it was sort of before its time because there was no transport down there. Right. And it was sort of a little bit like a white ele- pig elephant. Anyway, it was in 1989. Wow. But Harvey Goldsmith gave us, uh, we needed someone to open, so Pavarotti opened, wow. and then Pink Floyd came, and then I went to Australia because I was dating a girl from Australia and her parents for that. We went for Christmas. I fell in love with Australia in Christmas 1990. Met the top promoter there called Paul Dainty, sensational promoter who'd been there 20 years before. He'd started with Roy Orbison, but he was doing like Elton. And Australia is a sensational place to tour in. So I I worked with Paul and we did Fleetwood Mac and Phil Collins. And then I met Cher because Cher had been doing a cabaret and we decided that we wanted to tour her for the first time ever, really. When Sunny, she wasn't touring wow. and she was doing cabaret through the 80s. But David Geffen gave her a record deal and she became this phenomenon with her record deal and Moonstruck, which won an Oscar. So as an international promoter, we said, let's bring Cher to Australia she and I got on, and I got on really well with her manager. So Cher sponsored me to the United States in July of 91 to be part of her management team. And I was sort of overseeing the commercial activities and the touring, the right. music touring. Right. But so to answer your question, go back to the, you know, I was a, a rebel, but a rebel's much more interested in questions than settling on answers. So... The difference between there's no difference between the past and the present really yesterday every day every yesterday is purely a shaping for today you know we don't hold on to the past we don't fear the future we just stay present Cher saw that in me because 
I had to deal with a lot of mess in negotiations and concerts and disappointments. And, and I don't stress that much. Right. I love what you just said with regards to the past, the future, but the now. How do you think that, obviously Cher picked that out in you as, a, as one of your main skill sets. How do you think you were able to, to be that person? I'm interested and intrigued to know myself. It's, it's a question I don't think anyone can answer because what's central at source is just very, very beautiful. And yet a lot of us will fall into the minefields of our minds and they will vice us. I think I was shaped a lot because of a couple of my names, because I'm Charlie Stewart Gay. So obviously I had to deal, well, Stewart, I didn't know, it wasn't obvious. I was wearing a kilt. My mum was friends with the Queen. And, and for a period of my three to seven-year-old life, I thought I was royal, right? <laughs> and clearly the Stewarts were no longer royal. So that was a big mess. And then I went to prep school in Eton with the last name Gay. Right. So I had to deal with that. Um, but I was, I think to answer your question, I was graced. I've seen many people vice in their life through an incident that's occurred where they will put judgment on the incident and we will prevent them from being as great as they can be. Um, even in relationship to, to money, for instance, a lot of people said, well, I can't do that because I don't have the money. Right? So many entrepreneurs that I've known have a completely different attitude, people that are highly loved and respected because they don't get held back by that huge reyoke, well, I don't have the money. You look at one of my patrons to do with, we did landmine removal. We brought land, landmine detection, landmine removal down from $1,000 to eight. Wow. Mandela was my, Nelson Mandela was my patron and his wife, and John Paul de Giorgio was a patron. Well, JP, who lives here in Hollywood in Austin, he failed twice. The word fail is, a wrong, is probably the wrong word. He experienced two incidents where he started two haircut companies. Right. Neither of them were, were, had an authentic exchange with the customers. So because he didn't have that exchange, he didn't have any money, he was living in the back of his car collecting cans in Ventura. Right. The third company, he went back to the manufacturer. He said, look, guys, I can't afford, I haven't paid you for the last two, but I'm, this is the one. This is it. Yeah. This is it. Can you make me 5,000 bottles? And they said, well, all right, we will. And, but we'll only give you black and white bottles. He said, okay, just put Paul Mitchell on the bottle. Just put Paul Mitchell on the bottle, right? But Paul Mitchell. And then, you know, later on in life, a guy comes to him and says, you know, there's this blown glass bo a bottle out of Mexico that's got a tequila in it. Um, and JP says, I don't drink, but, you know, Here's some money and give it back to me if you can't sell it. That was Patron. No way. Yeah. <laughs> Paul Mitchell, Patron, I mean, two extraordinary brands. Where, where the commonality lies is, is understanding how to move forward in marketing and branding like you probably would be aware of and, and not being held back by the limiting beliefs. Yeah. Because other people would say, well, the wide, wide market for premium tequila is only 11,000 cases or whatever. Well, that wasn't right. Right. So, you know, again, it's more being interested in the questions than settling on the, all the answers that are given to you, but also recognizing sort of the irrevocability and the brilliance of what we're touching. Yeah. I think as well, Charlie, as you were saying that, I was thinking, you, a lot of people have their own opinions on things and they, put, they, they project their own opinions onto you or whoever else. And if you're not ready 
you get absorbed by what their opinions are and you take on their opinions, which aren't your own beliefs, right? And that's where you can get mixed up in not moving forward, as you've just mentioned, with JP and the two brands and everything else, Paul Mitchell and Patron. If you get caught up in other people's beliefs and don't stay focused on what you actually truly believe or what your gut's telling you, that's when people are held back as well, right? Totally, because creative genius is divine inspiration. Divine inspiration is creative genius. But around that, which is present, it's again, it's going back to the now. And having an intuition, obviously, you know, some people produce products and ideas before their time. You know, if we produce gluten or grain-free 10 years ago, that probably was before our time. Right. And then others would label it on individuals. But for decades or centuries, we've been looking at individuals. But now we're getting to a place of a collective. And it's the collective that's, and the consumer is incredibly savvy. And the consumer has no intention of believing you if you just put a green leaf on a logo two months before the Gulf of Mexico and you're called BP. Right. It doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. You have to be what you're bringing out. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, that's real authenticity, right? Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I have this conversation multiple times with people, brands, and companies about how you need to be authentic to yourself and the product and the customer. It's not rocket science, but a lot of people don't get that. When you were here working with Share, what, what, what happened from then to where, what brings you up to where you are now? I know there was a lot of stuff in between. Yeah, so that was... I, rat, I mean, I was still rattling around. I was, I mean, a lot of us are very good at being servicing other people. You know, we're very good at giving without necessarily understanding how to receive. So uh, I was, on the surface, very good at my businesses, my business. Um, but inside, I wasn't necessarily. And because I was in rock and roll, I was drinking, occasionally doing drugs, uh, and being pretty disrespectful at times when I had the switch turned off. Right. You know? Um, and then in 90, end of 94, I shifted. Um, Dante, this is out of the blue, but Dante 750 years ago started his Dante's Inferno, which was a book that really recognized love and light and fear and darkness and the whole washing machine of that, which is still going on now. And he said, in the middle of the road of my life, I awoke upon a dark wood where the true way was wholly lost. In the middle of the road. And I, I was in a bar on Sunset Boulevard with names that you would know. And something happened. And I had shocked myself a few times before. I won't get into the stories where I survived and others ne didn't necessarily wake up to their next dawn. Right. And some very successful rockers, for instance, that we all loved, you know, passed too soon. Right. But I didn't, and, and I was kept safe. So from that moment, which was 26 years ago, uh, and I didn't use a program or anything, it just something went within me uh, initially. Um, I, I've been really interested in releasing myself from the buffers to my feelings. Um, I think everything in the past has been held back by judgment. If you look at it from history, written by men, written by winners, money's energy, obviously the black and white thing, the men and women thing. And now I'm seeing this inevitability of the collective coming together. But that's been a journey for me for 26 years. And, and so I love stretching way beyond any of my own boundaries. And I've got, you know, a, a lot of things going on, like we all do. But the more I stretch, the more I may have an opportunity to, to have a limiting belief and then swab it with compassion and self-forgiveness of self-judgment. So even people who work around me or work with me, my wife obviously is like my grail, Daniela. She's remarkable. Um, but everyone is working. Everyone is doing the best they know how. If they knew any different, they'd be doing it. Right. So the whole is always bigger than the parts as well, especially when one gets very clear about that. 
Well, let me ask you this because you just said that, Charlie. You mentioned that with all of the people that work around you or within the companies that you own and run, that everyone's trying to do their best. Do you, do you try to bring that out from... I didn't say try. I said they're doing their best. Okay. They're doing their best. If they knew any different, they'd be doing it. It's like every incident, every person, every interchange. So Mandela was in prison for 27 years. 27 years. Yeah. He came out and he created Truth and Reconciliation Councils. In Liberia, where we funded the first Women's Empowerment College, Salif created Truth and Reconciliation Councils. You know, you're seeing such divides right now in our world that truly we have to come deeper into that. So it's not, a, it's, a, it's like we don't need to try to save the world because the world heals itself. Mm -hmm. It has every capacity to heal if we recognize how to give and receive care. And what I mean on a personal basis, when I was a kid, I'm in love, I'm in love, I'm in love. I'm in love. <laughs> you know, there's a girl, I'm in love. The more I recognize the depth of caring, both in the giving and the receiving of care, it's much easier to give, by the way, than it is to receive. You can hide behind giving. You can blame yourself or blame yourself for not being another. To receive, you have to be utterly open in your vulnerability, which just also means you're not holding on to the past or fearing the future. Yeah. yeah. And, and then in that care, maybe we glimpse what love is. Same on the planet. Planet heals itself. If we try to struggle to try to save things, it's a beingness, not a doing. Shakespeare said it. I mean, he said a bunch of words, and then he said, to be or not to be, that is a question. question. He didn't say to do or not to do. That's an answer. <laughs> I, I love that. So I'm not laughing at you. I just, I'm going with the energy, and yeah. I love that you just said that. You know, as you were saying that, Charlie, it was making me think – my wife and I have been on a journey since we moved to America and, and, and starting to really figure things out for ourselves. And something that we, I've said this before, you kind of feel a bit stuck. And I've spoken to other people from other countries in the world and how their upbringing is. And, you know, that old British saying, oh, stiff up a lip, you know, pull your socks up, all of that rubbish. You kind of feel like you're set in boundaries but essentially what you're talking about is very open and easy for everybody to understand. You just have to go deeper inside, open up your heart and listen and, and love more, right? Yes. I mean, it's easy on one way and it, it's incredibly hard on another. To, to take the deepest cut and to go within is not an easy process because there's pain. And, and it can't, I mean, we won't get too deep into it, but everything hinges on worth and lovability. Nothing I do, no title, no jobs, no acts of uh, no charity, nothing I do proves me worthy. I'm worthy simply because I am, and so are you, you know? But I think we're very blessed to be at this time on the planet. I'm incredibly hopeful in the long term future of the planet, because every former generation had massive judgment. All these judgments that caused the wars, you know, Henry VIII had judgment. He created a church because he wanted to have Anne Boleyn, you know. Then James comes along and creates a Bible, you know. He created, they all have their judgments. And this, I mean, you just look at everything. And the reality is that this is a generation has been given the gift and the challenge of choosing the destiny of the planet. And it may not be gifted to children in 20, 30 years' time. So there is now, out of the three chaotic points that we can all have, we can go from creation, I did, you did, we can have our childhood, we all had it, we can have our confusion, in our childhood, who am I? What's my identity? What, what am I meant to be doing? 
confusion could lead us to living in compromise, rattling between. And this happens with businesses. Businesses have great ideas, but they have to, at some point, they may compromise, like you said before, because of the valuation of a stock market price. It's stupid. You know, it shouldn't have been given that valuation. And so they pander to the investors or whatever. So in the compromise of our lives, we rattle between the bookends that we've chiseled for ourselves systematically through our lives of love and light and fear and darkness. And occasionally, you know, conflict happens on the soul of our, and when we put our head on the pillow, we're conflicted. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't have done that. Should never have done that. And God forbid you see my chaos. So that's sort of where we are on the planet. We had the three choices. One choice of chaos is, God, get us out of this. Or bail me out, government. We repeat the pattern because we haven't dealt with the issue. The second is we'll ignore this. We can live this way and we can see where it's going, but it, we're going to ignore it. We'll leave it to someone else or it won't, it won't show up. The third choice is where we're all getting to right now on the planet, which is to go like that. But because we're a collective now and not individuals and the power of what you're doing here and the internet and everything else and has brought us all together. Boundaries have broken down. Genders are together. Clearly, we're all together. The old is holding on. The new's coming through. There's a little bit of, of, of mess still to do with black and white, clearly. Things still need to go really deep and healing around that still to do with men and women. Women are on fire everywhere, everywhere, you know? Yeah. And even faith now is for faith itself, more than it used to be. Yeah. They're still holding on, but faith is for faith itself. So we're at a good, good point to bring this all forward, whatever is meant to be. Right, right. I love it. I love all of that, Charlie. So from what you've just said, let's talk a bit about what you believe the businesses and companies and foundation you run now mm -hmm. and how that plays a role in, in what you've just said as well. Right. Well, one is food is essential, clearly. And we're fortunate during COVID that our company's grown over 125%. God bless, you know, a lot of people and companies that came into COVID that, that, that didn't have the opportunity that we've had. Yeah. You know, we're getting chains pulling over to get the, the, the chips and the tortillas and we're moving into frozen meals now wow. as well. We just raised the bar. Uh, there's conscious commitments that you can see, see at Real Coconut Kitchen. Uh, and we're also knew that we wanted to bypass supermarkets on some levels and bring this incredible food that we have directly to the customers. So you've obviously seen the Ubers and the Postmates. You've seen, obviously, you go in to get your prepared foods at your favorite supermarket. So we've been, over the last six years, alchemying grain-free, gluten-free, dairy-free, refined sugar, no soy. We've been alchemying that. People have seen the tip of the iceberg with chips and tortillas. Now, tortillas don't break. So everyone loves our tortillas that are food service people, uh, and they don't have messy binders. Right. We went beyond gluten because gluten-free isn't enough. Because normally there's a bunch of crap to make it gluten-free, right. grain-free, and keeping it clean. So all of those things are happening. Foods, for us, food is, is, is everything along with how we make the food and the water around that. Then the other area that we love is creating these containers so, of conversation. In the past, we'd have these conversations in meeting places or we'd be on Google on we still are, where I can speak to you in half, you know, for half an hour in three weeks time, you know, speak to my assistant. So what we're doing is we're collect, creating these spaces. Sonara's one, obviously, in Tulum, the hotel that we created, and then we're doing more in Belize, and we're doing them in every city in America. Wow. That's what we use. You met me in a curative conscious container. Yeah. You thought you were coming in 
to get fish and chips. Happened to be gluten and grain, dairy free fish and chips. But what happened was magic. Yeah. Because then you meet. And so these spaces are resonating with people and magic and mystery is showing up. And we're seeing the collective of what we're doing, just like everything else in the past, every movement, every great business forum, what's ever mentioned in a meeting place often creates ripples from the waves that two people will meet in a conference. And the guys that are running the conference would never know that. And they go off and they do their thing. So it's sort of a Lord of the Rings, bring it down into a nutshell. It's sort of a Lord of the Rings moment. And we're creating spaces for oddball, different shapes, sizes to just come and congregate yeah. and be. Yeah. Meeting them with food, which is a great place to meet any tummy. It's a great place. And then, and then uh, seeing what shows up. And, you know, we're also involved with energy and solar and all of those things because you can't ignore, ignore any of that when it comes to, to the production of food and, and running of hotels. Yeah. You know, in Tulum, we're off the grid. So talk, I'm really interested about the hotel in Tulum. Can you talk a bit more about that? That was the first one, right? Am I right? Yes, there? it is. So my wife and I, Daniela, Daniela met me when I was in Liberia doing the humanitarian humanitarian work. She'd had two children. I'd had three. She'd been a dive instructor, having cured her breathing underwater, which she should never do. She had collapsed lungs when she was a kid. So her life story is not being held back by the, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a really sick child. Right. And I'm going to let that dictate my life. She did things that have shifted. And she's, she's what drives really the awareness of our businesses. I'm more the essential applier, just like I was with Cher. Yeah. But I also bring all, you know, that, that feeling of, of sustainability, which I've had in Africa and Mandela and all of this stuff before. So we went to Tulum in 2012 and we just fell in love with the space. And it was before sort of everyone thinking about it now. And we decided to live there because I started broadcasting inside of Facebook and Twitter concerts and fashion shows, which had come forward in England way before America. Right. So there were companies that I was involved with that were doing Gaga or Rihanna or the BBC or Doctor Who or, or whatever, uh, or UEFA. And we were broadcasting with a wireframe inside of Facebook and Twitter. Wow. And that was just an extension of doing live concerts live into 3D, live into theatres, because we can do that because all the theatres are digitised. And then I asked the question, because it was a question, well, if we're going to do this concert in South Africa, can we also do it in social media? Right. And no one had done it before. Right. So we brought it forward. Um, so because of that, we're also doing like TEDx and stuff like that. So I thought, well, I can live on the beach of Tulum, and I can go to Cancun, which is a pretty cheap ticket flight to L.A., New York, Toronto, Europe. It's the best hub. So the conversation was, should we live in, you know, the valley? Should we live in New York? Should we live in England, wherever? And then we just said, let's live in Tulum. So we moved the kids there. We started a school within a month because there wasn't a school. So we were like painting the walls. And we started the school. And then we went down to the beach. And Tulum is considered one of these vortexes of energy. Right. But obviously, the Mayans were there. There's a lot of history. We won't get into it. But for me, with everything else, like I've shared before, this washing machine between love and light and fear and darkness, every beach, everything has, has that struggle going on right. because you have locals who've been on the beach forever. You have state as in Cancun, and you have federal, as in Mexico City. And so, and, and Tulum started with Pablo Escobar at one end, the drug lord, and then the guys that came out of the Osho ashram in America finished up in Tulum at the other end, creating the word ecstasy. Right. So, and then Victoria's Secret and photographers went to the beach, fell in love with the beach, because it's such a gorgeous place. They started building spaces. So when we went there, there were about two or three small boutique hotels, tiny hotels, 
and uh, we just decided to put a space together. And so the hotel uh, itself, you said it's off grid. Yeah. So six years, we opened it 2014. It was number three in the world on Harper's Bazaar's top 150 greatest hotels two years ago. Wow. And um, we, uh, we, everything's off the grid on the beach. It's not in the town. The town is five kilometers away and there's mangroves. The Tulum town is not, it's one of those only beaches that is not part of the town because there's mangroves and you can't do anything on the mangroves. Right. So the beach basically required anything on there. So our, if you poop, right, everybody poops, we put in microbes uh, that literally eat through the poop. Right. And we'd seen that in Eastern Europe and in Africa. It, the, the microbes came from Redwood, Northern California. You look in the tanks, you think you're going to gag because it's poop. <laughs> And you don't, it's odorless. Right. And since day one, that's been our system. We turn black water into clear water and we don't pump because we don't want to see sediment going into places to then pollute oceans. Right, right. So it was, you know, it was fun to do that. And we also put an unbelievable yoga studio right on the beach. Everyone else would have put a villa because it was money. But we wanted the practitioners who gifted themselves to Lum for the last 15 or 20 years before the best space in the entire beach to practice yoga. Wow. And then we put real coconut restaurant, a wellness spa center, and then the rooms. And then we're fortunate that we also have jungle land on the other side of the road. Most of the spaces don't. Wow. So we were able to create our own carpentry shops. We do all our own, uh, all our own amenities. Everything is created. Wow. And we had 89 staff for 19 suites. Wow. So it's been an amazing blessing. People who came there then said, oh, Charlie, Daniel, you should be doing this here, here, here. And you should be doing this food in, in America. And Whole Foods came and said, can you come and cook for us in Austin? Right. And WeWork said, can you do canteens in all our WeWorks? We said, no, because we want to have a life. <laughs> and... So we've done everything as well, which is important in balance. So don't compromise, obviously, on creative ideas, but also be in balance in your life is another thing that I would say to people yeah, yeah. is, you know, to be healthy, as I said, physically, emotionally, mentally, if those three things we're nudging, because we can't, we'd slip every day. Yeah. And things happen around us every day, and especially when there's a lot of companies and a lot of people. But the point is stay in present and, and stay in balance. Stay in the loving of the family as well. There's nothing, nothing. First of all, nothing is more expensive than ignorance in my life. That's a statement that I've said for the last 10 years. There is nothing that I've learned in life that is more expensive than ignorance. When you know that you know, don't slip, don't compromise, yeah. don't get money from places you shouldn't get it from, you know, and, and just move, move everything forward with steps that are sort of small steps done very, very quickly. Yeah. And then the world will look at you and say, how did you do that? Yeah. That looks ridiculous. But really, it's thousands of small steps. You know? I love it. Charlie, you're a true inspiration. I could carry on talking with you forever. I've enjoyed everything that you've said. I'm inspired by what you do and all of the work you do outside of your companies and with your companies. Um, tell everybody where they can find out more information about the hotel and the kitchens and the CPG product as well. It's been great speaking. It's been great speaking. Thanks. So the hotels are Sonara, S-A-N-A-R-A, hotels.com. Uh, and Sonara means it will heal. So that's that. Then Real Coconut Kitchen uh, is what's now going to be, hopefully, in cities around the world, started in Los Angeles. And that's delivering directly to customers within a 25-mile radius of what we call a virtual kitchen. Wow. And then you come to the restaurant. 
And then therealcoconut.com is the current CPG brand as well. Um, and that's changing in the new year. So you're just going to have to see how that changes. Okay. Yeah. I can't wait. Charlie, thank you again for so much for your time. It's been a blessing and I've learned a lot from you. Thank you. Thank you, Luke.